Hello, my name is Cameron Jack. Um, I am an assistant professor at the University of Florida. Uh, I'm happy to happy to talk to you about Varroa, and I'm sure that a large portion of you are just sick and tired of hearing about Varroa, and I am sorry about that. But this is reality now. Um, it's going to be something that we just you're going to get used to talking about. This is what in the states we've been talking about for 30 years. It just kind of dominates all of our meetings uh, because it really is the biggest threat that we have. So. I go around the country and and to different places in the world and talk about varroa control. But with you today, I want to talk about responsible varroa control, right? Because it's not just, you know, we can do a lot to kill mites, but I want you to do this in a way that it will be sustainable for you and your operations and for the other beekeepers around you. So we're going to talk about responsible Varroa control. First, I just want to give you um, just a quick uh, little introduction to myself. Um, you know, I I have I already said I work at the uh, University of Florida. I have an interesting job um, because, and it's it's quite different than most others uh, professors in the United States, at least, where I have a split where I'm seventy percent teaching, thirty percent research. If you ask any research professor about their split that just basically means they do 100 percent of teaching and 100 percent of research you just you're everybody's overwhelmed everybody's busy we're doing a million things million different projects all the time but what's interesting about my job you know is is uh i think as far as i understand and know i think i was the first person ever in the united states that was hired to just teach beekeeping at a university like a top tier university level right like i i um started out a few years ago where all I did was teach bees and I um, created all these university courses. And um, now we have about 600 students a year that are going through taking beekeeping courses. Now, most of them are not going to grow up and be beekeepers, right? But at least there are people that are getting experience and knowing about honeybees, knowing the issues. You know, all of them are voters, right? So, so having people that understand bees and apiculture kind of going out in society, that, that's huge, um, in my opinion. I think that's great. So in the last three, four years, I have kind of switched over, and now I have a, t a research role, again, where I can um, conduct the research I want. And primarily, most of my work is focused on control of Roa destructor because, again, this is really – the scourge of the honeybee. It's like the most important thing that we really need to talk to talk about. I know some of you are probably, again, sick of hearing of that and maybe even disagree. Um, I'm going to convince, I'm going to hopefully convince you <laughs> that, that this really is a problem um, and something that needs to be taken seriously by everybody. So the very first thing I'm going to do is just share with you some, some research that uh, some colleagues and I did um, a few years ago that I think will hopefully, it goes a long way, at least in convincing USB keepers that they really need to do something um, because it can, it's, it's a problem, right? So basically what we did in this research is we um, set up these different cohorts of colonies and we were like basically watching Varroa growth by season. So we would have 20 colonies every season in one of the locations kind of close to us. So we had 20 colonies that we established in the winter, 20 in the spring, 20 in the summer, and 20 in the autumn. And we would, um, and, and basically what we would do is just like watch these Varroa populations grow. We would, we would do our best to get them down to zero mites per hundred bees as you know, as close to zero as we can get, right? And then we just step back, watch the overall populations grow over time. We did this over two years, and it was actually probably one of the most costly studies we've ever done, not just in manpower of time of like going and sampling, washing all these samples and stuff, but just cost of bees. I mean, we, we to see what happened, we really let some of these colonies just die um, over time. And so it was just expensive and it was a hard it was a hard study to do for lots of reasons um but let me walk you through some of the data that we saw 
So again, this is I, we did this over two years. And so what we're doing here is we're compiling both years of data. So both of the winter and the spring and the summer and the fall. And, and like I said, we, um, we got them as close to zero mites as possible. So right here on the y-axis, this is our number of mites per 100 bees. And then this is like over the months since we treated. So we get them close to zero at the start and then we just let the populations grow. And so let's, I wanna look at this. You know, this is probably not too much of a shock for you here, but it is uh, kind of important, I think, to establish this. So when we, in the winter, were um, treating hard and getting our mites as close to zero, you know, what we would see is, we. this is that blue, dark blue line here. See how it took us about four months before it kind of crossed back into this, what we consider to be a, a damaging threshold, this red dotted line of three mites per hundred bees. So it took us about four months, four and a half months to really get there, right? Um, so it does, it does give us some, you know, bang for your buck to treat at that time. This pink line here is like the spring, uh, represents the spring. And when we treated in the spring and we got them, you know, treated the willies out of them, got them close to zero, then that took about five months before they reached that threshold point. When you do this in the summer, this is summer is this uh, yellow line here. It was about like two and a half to three months is bam, they're right back up at those high mite loads. In the fall, it was even quicker for us, you know, two months, bam, they're right up. So it's, it's uh, just kind of shows you that, you know, you're, you're likely to get the most bang for your buck when you are treating in the winter and the spring. So it's, it's really important to keep that in mind because as we later on in this presentation, as we're talking about varroa control, you're, you really want to time your treatments effectively and, and hit them hard at those periods of times when you can, because later on in autumn, um, you know, good luck. You, you, if your mite loads are really high, it's really hard to bring them back down. You know, if I, if I had, I, I'm just for the purposes of this figure, I'm stopping at six months. But if we were to watch all these mite populations kind of grow and crash, um, all of them started to crash at around between like eight and like 11 months or sorry, eight and 11 mites per hundred bees. Once they reach that threshold, bam, they were just coming down. So if you let your mites grow too much, they're going to crash. Now, I know already a lot of you are rolling your eyes because you're like, Cameron, we don't have deformed wing virus, right? I know, I know that you don't have deformed wing virus. So this figure would probably, at least the, the amount of colonies that are dying, right? Like that's going to be different for you than it is for us. We'll talk about this a little bit more as we get in here, but in my, I'm just going to say it right now at the beginning, you know, regardless if, if you don't have an issue right now, you have mites, but you don't have the same viruses, don't just sit on that and be like, well, I don't need to do anything, right? Because the moment you do have viruses, like wham, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be out of a business. Yeah, so it's it's going to hit you hard and you have to do these things to kind of get ready. Okay, so that was one little plug. I'm going to probably say that a couple more times. But but um, so this is kind of what we saw as like just just a, as a convincing that like varroa populations grow rapidly. Now, keep in mind that this is in Florida. I would say that our uh, climate is going to be closer to like what would be in Queensland than, than down in Victoria. But but still, you know, you, you would expect to see kind of a similar growth in really in, in any of these climates. So this next figure, this is part of the same study, but what we did here, this is just a different way to kind of show that your bees died. So what we're looking at was the months, um, uh, like colony lifespan. So again, yours would look different than this without, with the absence of deformed wing virus. However, um, you know, for us, this is this is serious business, right? Like, notice that in the summer and in and in the the fall for us, you know, between like seven and eight months is about all you get. If you don't treat your your bees are are going to die within this amount of time. In the spring and the winter, you get away with it a little bit longer uh, because there's time for your bees to kind of recover and grow before they start crashing. You know, when we 
um, treat it in the winter and then just let them go. You know, at least this first year, we had about 11, it took about 11 and a half months before the majority of them started dying. But notice that this, I split this one up by a year. So we have year one right here and we have year two. And I wanted to show these distinctly because they were significantly different when we did our statistical analyses. Um, you know, the winter only gave us about seven and a half to eight months of survival in year two, but in year one, it gave us a few months extra, right? So what are some of the differences that, you know, from year to year? I mean, you guys see this already when you're just with your regular bees, you know, and in some years you have a really strong nectar flow. Your bees are looking good. Other years, maybe it's really dry when you're not getting the same nectar flow. Your bees are looking kind of crummy, you know, so there's, there are differences from year to year. And so that you're, the way that Varroa are going to affect your bees is going to be different from year to year too. So again, the point I wanted to, to show you with this is that it, your Varroa populations are going to grow rapidly and they will eventually start affecting your bees and your, your colonies are going to die without some proper management. Now you're in a position within Australia. Some of you might be in areas where you're, you're being exposed to Varroa, probably the majority of you are not yet, but um, I guess I just, if I could just go back in time, right, like and start convincing uh, the United States beekeepers to take it a bit more seriously, there's, there's so many things that we would probably do different. So this is just, you know, what my grandma would probably look like if, if she could just be warning us, right? It's like, just don't make the same mistakes as other people, right? You're in a position to start fresh, to do it right from the get-go. Don't do the same things that we have done in our commercial beekeeping industry, which has been primarily using the same chemical control over and over and over and over and over until we lose that. And then we switch to something else and then we use it over and over and over and over and over until we lose it, right? There's something called integrated pest management that I know a lot of you are already familiar with if you have anything to do with agriculture in general, right? But there, there are some kind of, at least I, I don't, I could teach all day for, you know, I could teach a course on integrated pest management, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just boil it down into basically four steps are like four cornerstones of IPM because integrated pest management basically means that you are using integrated techniques to control your pests, right? You're not just using one thing. And this, the different steps involve you setting some economic decision levels. So there are, there's basically, there's, there's a reason for everything you're doing. You're not just throwing in any chemical because it works you are throwing in chemicals at the appropriate time, right? Or you're doing non-chemical controls, right? We'll, we'll talk about all that, but that it all kind of comes down to economics and setting, setting those thresholds. Next, in order to be able to like predict when you should be doing your treatments, you have to correctly be able to identify the pest and you have to have a way to monitor the pest so that you have an accurate level of those pest populations so you can make the appropriate decisions. Next, there are some things that you can do to prevent and avoid. And this is where a lot of you come in right now is like that early detection and, and you know, maybe restricting the movement of bees in certain locations, right? Because you are doing your best to prevent and avoid where it comes in. This is one of those things where, gosh, I know that it's expensive um, to do some of these prevention techniques and, and you might be annoyed that, that, uh, you know, maybe your government is spending millions of, of dollars to, to do a certain thing to like rid Vro of a certain area. But I promise you <laughs> like $10 million that you spent right now on like prevention and avoiding is, is so much worth it. I mean, in the United States, like $10 million wouldn't even clear up the state of Rhode Island of Varroa, right? Like, so it's so much easier to prevent than it is to control and reduce or like eradicate, right? Like it's so difficult to do that. So take, we're going to talk a little bit about that step. And the last 
kind of focus is going to be on the control. We'll, we'll walk through the different levels of, of Varroa control and we'll spend most of the time talking about that. But I just wanted to kind of set this whole IPM framework so we're, we're all clear on this. And if you are interested, you know, uh, Jamie Ellis and I put together an, an article. I know that a lot of you have seen it um, because a lot of people have, have talked to me about it. But, but this, we tried to write a review that was comprehensive um, and that had a lot of information. We were trying to basically synthesize 80 years of Varroa research into like one paper and put it in a framework that is related to, you know, integrated pest management and responsible control. And it took us uh, about five years to write this. Um, it's just really large, intensive. It represents, um, you know, just months of work and just lots and lots of time went into this. So anyways, there's a QR code if you want to check it out. If you just even Google Varroa IPM review or something or Journal of Insect Science Varroa, you're going to find it. It'll it'll show up. OK, so let's start with that first pillar that was um, the setting the economic decision levels. So what I mean by that is, you know, we, we're setting a threshold, which it becomes prudent to take action, right? Like, so it, we're making our, our choices based on economics rather than just like feelings or the calendar year. That's what a lot of U.S. beekeepers have done historically is like, ah, oh, it's June 1st. I got to throw in uh, uh, amateur ass treatment, right? Like, we're, we're setting this based on economics. It makes a lot more sense. It takes a little bit more thinking power, but I promise you it makes more sense and it'll save you money later. So there are basically two different decision levels that we need to make. There's the economic injury level, which I'll define in a minute. And then there's um, like an action threshold or some people call it like the economic threshold. So let's start with this economic injury level because this is important to really define because this is the level that we consider to be like our break even point where basically the cost of controlling the pest is going to be equal to the economic damage that it's causing. This is a little bit tricky with Varroa. You know, if we, if we were doing regular ag, like if I was growing a acre of strawberries, right? Like I could probably have a very mathematical formula that like a certain number of two spotted spider mites is going to equal this much damage in my strawberries and then I will lose this much money. It's a little bit harder to do those kind of calculations um, with honeybees, but we I, I will kind of show you in a minute just like how you could get an estimation of that economic injury level. So what you need to keep in mind is that like when our rural populations exceed that economic injury level, we're losing money, right? we want our goal is to try to keep it below that economic injury level. So the, here's an example of how we would try to calculate um, this economic injury level. There's a, there's a formula. It's not particularly difficult normally, but like I said, honeybees are kind of a, a, a weird system. And so it doesn't fit maybe exactly be, I'll tell you why. So like, so if, if C is the cost of controlling the, the pest, we can calculate that, right? Like I know how much one strip of apivar is going to cost me if I put it in per colony, right? Like I can, I can figure that out. V equals the value of the commodity per unit. So like how much money does one hive, one colony bring to you, right? You could probably, it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're on uh, like a crop that you're pollinating, you could probably break it down to per hive, right? And then if you're, you know, if you're, you're making honey, you could probably figure out about how much honey you're going to get and break it down to the value of each hive, right? So you can get kind of close with those two. You can also get really close at the end, the number of pests in like that are injuring the area. Like, so you can, there are ways that we can quantify the number of mites that are in a hive, but here's where it really gets tricky is like the percentage of the commodity that is injured. So, so the 
the number of mites where your bees are starting to get injured. And that depends a lot on the viruses. And this is where it gets a little tricky because there's not a good way to just rapidly, I guess, estimate the amount of virus loads. There are some, there are some molecular ways of detecting virus loads, right? But it's just, it's not something that's like readily available for beekeepers to just have at the, in their back pocket. But let's, let's, let's humor me for just a minute and let's, let's pretend that we've got, um, we've got this formula basically figured out. I worked out that it's going to cost me about $7 per hive to use Apivar as an example. It's kind of expensive. And if I'm going to set my number of pests that I'm, that I'm finding at like that three mites per hundred bee level. And then if I said that, ah, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be pollinating, um, almonds. And so uh, it's going to be about a $200 per hive that I'm going to get. And then I'm kind of setting this injury, uh, this, this injury variable kind of is, is a little bit uh, of guesswork here, but let's say that about 20% of my bees probably have some kind of virus and they're, they're sick and not performing well because of these mites. Okay. So if I was able to use this into the formula, you know, I would end up with something about 0.53 mites per 100 bees. That's actually pretty low, right? Compared to what a lot of the injury levels that we usually talk about. So you can, I mean, this is a great place to start to be like, okay, well, we're going to try our best to keep our mites low, you know, below this, this level so that I'm uh, saving money, I'm breaking even. So for those of you that don't have mites in your, your colonies yet, like you're able to keep that out of your apiary, great. Um, because, you know, even at about a half a mite <laughs> per hundred bees, um, you're, you're already running into areas where you are losing money, right? So you, you just need to be conscious of this, you know, and think about the, the economic injury level is going to kind of depend, um, you know, like I said, based on that formula, but there's, there are like the, the, action thresholds of like when you decide you're going to take some action you know we we have some different guesses at least in the states of like what we have found and i do feel like this is an area that needs to be researched further there's it's it's just kind of hard to study which is why there's a lot of guesswork kind of involved here but the number of mites that we can have in our bees and get away with really kind of depends on the season you know when our colonies are at peak population, see how we can get away with a little bit more about like two to five mites per hundred bees is like when we're kind of in that worry zone where we need to start doing that something. If you go over five, like I said, that max is gets to be about like 11 to 12 mites per hundred bees. And then those colonies just all start collapsing around it. So you want to start taking action early. Um, but when your colonies are, are broodless or at least with low amounts of brood, you know, you want to be a little bit more careful. You should be keeping them below like 2% or something like that. You know, it just, it kind of depends. The point I'm trying to make is it depends on your colony phase to some degree. Now, this is kind of putting this, these thresholds back into like the big picture here. You know, we have our economic injury level here, this line, EIL. This is where we are losing money if we if our mite populations go above this right so we are doing something at the economic threshold or the action threshold um, to bring it back down and this kind of depends on what pests we're talking about because you can apply all these same principles to small hive beetles for instance or like to wax moths or whatever like you can you can use the same basic principles um, in any situation really but the idea is that you're as those pests increase and once they cross a certain threshold then you've got to do some kind of treatment to prevent them from from hitting that that point right so hopefully that all makes sense let's go on to the second cornerstone that second pillar is identify and monitor now this at least is where we have some good things going for us i think in the varroa in the varroa world like there are lots of documents out there. There's lots of videos. There's lots of just material out there for you to help you be able to correctly identify bro. This is like the bottom of a, of an alcohol wash. You can see the mites are just kind of these brown, uh, you know, football shaped, um, pests, right? These, and, uh, 
And so you can probably identify them pretty quick, right? Just, just by looking at them. Um, but in order to have something like to be able to keep an eye on your varroa population so you can time those treatments most effectively, you have to be monitoring regularly. Now, this is one of those areas, again, where you can get a lot of eye rolls. And so I'll, I guess, thankfully, I'm not there to see you rolling your eyes. But but um, it's so important to be monitoring, especially if you don't have it yet. That doesn't mean you're off the hook and you don't need to be looking, right? Like you, you do have to look. And I promise you that just looking at the mites, like looking at your bees and scanning them for any of these mites is not going to cut it right? Let me tell you a really quick story. So I have the opposite problem of all beekeepers in the world is why I can't get enough mites because I have to do research on these buggers in the lab, right? Like, so I need living mites to bring into the lab and I have to manage bees in a certain way that they produce tons of mites, but they stay alive. It's kind of a unique challenge in beekeeping, I guess. Um, and, and so, uh, I've, it takes a lot of work. You have to rotate frames constantly in and out. Um, so you're basically putting all these emerging bees with mites into these colonies to prop them up and kind of bring lots of mites. So I had been doing this work for a long time as part of my PhD. I'd been working on these Varroa, uh, population or like these, we call them our mite factory colonies. So we, I've been working on these mite factory colonies, uh, for a couple months, I had put in lots of time and effort. The day of the experiment arrives where I need about 300 um, mites to do my experiment. I go to the first uh, the first mite factory colony where I'm going to collect bees and shake off some mites. And I'm looking at this frame and I don't see a single mite and my heart is just like broken, right? Like I put in so much effort <laughs> into doing this. I have all this stuff set up in the lab. I also just wanted to finish my PhD at the time. I'm like, just desperate. Like, all right, well, I'm gonna collect some bees. I'll see what I can do. I'll try to scrape something together. Um, but then when I actually did the work of, of I, we were using powder sugar shakes at the time, which I'll explain in a minute, to like separate the mites. But so after I had collected these bees and shook off the mites, I found that I had over 80 mites per hundred bees, right? Like 80 mites per hundred bees. And I didn't see them and I got good vision, right? <laughs> and I didn't see these mites. So my whole point in telling you that is they are good at hiding because that's what they do, right? So just you looking at a frame is not going to cut it you really actually do need to use some methods where you are observing them. So I know that there are some different ways and you've probably heard people talking about this. Um, I know a lot of Australian uh, government researchers are, are looking or doing like powdered sugar shakes where they are putting bees into jars um, and you're getting about 300 bees or so and you're putting on you know, a couple of what we call, uh, you know, tablespoons of powdered sugar and you're rolling it around and you're, you're just shaking it out. So the mites are coming out and, um, and cause the mites basically have suction cup feet and they can't really hold on. Also the powdered sugar is going to drive the bees absolutely bonkers. And so they're grooming themselves and the mites are falling off. And, and so you can kind of shake it through this, this mesh. Um, and so you can count the mites. I know a lot of you have already seen this kind of before already. So that's one way you can do it. Personally, I prefer the alcohol watch, alcohol wash much better. Um, you know, it does mean you are sacrificing your bees entirely, but you can get a very direct answer as the number of mites per hundred bees that you're seeing. I have a honey sieve that I just dedicate to my mite washes so I can collect the bees in alcohol I shake it for about 30 seconds or so, and then I can dump it through the mesh, kind of rinse it, and then um, rinse it out of my sink, and then all the mites are kind of collecting on the really fine uh, mesh for my honey sieve. And so that's a good, easy, clean way for me to just measure this. Now, let me go back one second. Kind of the reason that a lot of people like powdered sugar shakes is because they feel like it doesn't hurt their bees that much. And so they can put their bees back into their colonies. And for you not having 
Varroa or you feel like you don't have Varroa yet um, and it's not been detected in your area, you might be just doing powdered sugar shakes to kind of look. In my opinion, for what it's worth, I'm not a regulatory official on your state, <laughs> but for what in my opinion is that the alcohol wash is just far superior. Like you're more likely to find it there than you are. Like sometimes you will miss mites with the, the powdered sugar. You're not going to miss mites with the alcohol wash. It does sacrifice some of them, but I'm telling you, these bees are not in great shape anyway. So you think you're doing your bees a solid by preserving the life of 300 of them, um, but most of them are not going to make it after that anyway. So you might as well just sacrifice them the way I feel because you get a better you get a better look. If you think of the colony as a super organism, the whole animal is the colony, right? In my like the way I view it is, it's like swabbing your mouth and getting some of the cells out of your mouth. It's not, you know, I don't want to hurt my bees either, but it's, it's worth it. Okay. The last thing is the last way people monitor is like using mite fall where they put like a sticky board underneath. And if they have screen bottom boards equipped, it's easy, but you can still, even with solids bottom boards, you can still put a, a mesh on them. So the bees don't get stuck and slide it into that bottom board. Um, in my opinion, this does not work particularly well unless it is coupled with a chemical treatment. So just sliding them in and checking them periodically just doesn't work. I actually like, if I'm going to do my fall, I do it in a 72 hour period. If you do it every day, you know, if it's a bright sunny day and most of the bees are out foraging, then you're getting fewer bees in the, the hive. I like to, I want to monitor when there's more bees in the hive. So I do it for 72 hours. So you get a bigger range. Um, also, like I said, I don't think it's very consistent at showing mites unless there is a chemical treatment that is coupled with it. Then at that point, it becomes somewhat useful. So, okay. So we've talked about setting our economic thresholds. We've talked about our, our identification and monitoring. Let's move to that third step of, of prevention. You know, this is where I, I don't know that I am the expert, frankly, um, when it comes to prevention. I mean, nobody does this prevention better than Australia. I mean, you, I've, <laughs> just the time that I have been there and the amount of stories that I've heard of others like going through customs is like intense, right? Like nothing gets in, you know, like it's, 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 uh, you guys do a, a fantastic job of, of keeping um, pests and pathogens out unless people don't play by the rules and then, <laughs> and then there's problems. Right. But, you know, the, this is actually an important part of integrated pest management is the keeping things away from you. Because like I said before, it's just so much more expensive to try to control a pest than it is to prevent one together. So um, I don't need to necessarily harp on this too much. You guys are living this day in, day out. You know, you know this a little bit um, better already than I, than I can even uh, really describe to you. So let's, let's move forward then to control. So this is where, you know, we, we will kind of give a quick run through of the different control techniques, because this is going to be different, um, kind of based on where you're at and what you're doing and, and what you need. Right. So, so let's keep in mind, uh, like you've, you've probably also seen this pyramid, right? Like before, not all controls are created equal. And so we usually break these up into categories of cultural controls, mechanical controls, biological controls, and chemical controls. And then keep in mind that even chemical controls, we can usually break them into two different subgroups of something that's like a bio pesticide, meaning like it's a natural control, it's coming from something living versus a synthetic chemical control, which means it's chemicals that are created in the lab that are usually meant to last long-term. So this is kind of like the further up this pyramid we go, like the greater the risk. And that's why you need to really have those economic thresholds in place. So you know, when my mites hit this level, I need to do something drastic to bring them down quickly. Or maybe you're playing the long game when you're keeping your mites low and you're, you're gonna be doing some of these other non-chemical controls first to bring, to keep them low, 
right? So let's let's walk through this a little bit. We'll start with our cultural controls. Now, cultural controls means that you are doing something to change the environment, to make it less suitable for that pest, right? So in this case, you've probably seen something like this before. This is some hygienic testing that, that uh, bee breeders have been doing all, all over the world for a long time. But one way to just measure that is through something like a freeze kill brood assay. There's also, some of you are probably familiar with some research that's been done relatively recently where they can use uh, pheromones to kind of do the same thing by spraying a section of comb with pheromones and, and the bees will remove that. So, but basically what the behavior that we are selecting for is hygienic behavior. This is an example of a freeze kill assay where you would put a cup uh, or like a PVC pipe or something, and you're pouring in some liquid nitrogen, you flash freeze and kill all the bees that are in this certain section. You put that frame back and you come back in 24 hours and you measure the percentage of, of brood that has been removed from that area. And if it has been removed uh, really thoroughly like this colony, then you know that this these bees are hygienic and they clean up their mess. Hygienic bees have been shown to keep varroa populations down. You know, you can see a picture here where they're removing a brood that has a varroa down in the cell because these hygienic bees can detect when there is a problem and they take care of that problem themselves, right? So using stock that is like some honeybee stock that is bred for uh bred for varroa control right, is, is a really great thing to do. And this is something that you can be doing um, now in your own apiaries. If this, if you have a, a knack for queen rearing and this is something that you enjoy, hey, this is, this is a great time to do it. Start selecting for hygienic stock now and you might be able to, to uh, help your cultural control game, right, in, in your colonies by getting some bees that are already kind of prepped and ready um, for when Varroa does arrive. Another example of a cultural control that I can think of for Varroa would be like causing a break in the brood cycle. So this is like an example of a, a queen cage that you kind of cut out a section of the foundation and the frames and, and you um, have the queen in there. Um, I've used these before for different experiments and they have been okay. I've caged queens up to 24 days and then they still come out and they're still okay. 24 days is like the amount of time it would take for a queen to lay an unfertilized egg and the time for that uh, to develop all the way into a drone, right? So you can get rid of 100% of all of your brood during that, and that would then halt varroa reproduction. I didn't really talk about varroa biology in depth, but I'm sure a lot of you are already aware that like varroa can only reproduce inside the honeybee brood cells. So if you don't have brood, you don't have the the varroa growing now that in itself is not usually just an effective treatment because your bees need brood or else your colonies are going to collapse anyways right so the idea is that you are controlling your brood for a certain amount of time or forcing that break so you're putting more of the bees on the bodies of the uh, adult workers and then you're timing other treatments like chemical treatments um, when the bees are most or sorry when the mites are most exposed right Okay, so that's that's cultural control. Let's move up the, the pyramid here to our mechanical control. And mechanical control means that we are doing something physically to either remove or kill the mites. So we can remove them using screen bottom boards, simple as that. Not very many, right? Like you can, at best it's been shown to, to remove about 10% of, of your mites. But I mean, it's a little thing that, that can help. Um, obviously, if, if you're in an area where you're going to have a harsh, cold winter, then you need to seal this up and you don't want to be exposing your bees to that. But during the spring, summer, um, fall, it could be a good time to do it, right? It does remove mites. It just doesn't move, remove a lot of them. So when I hear people say like, oh yeah, I'm practicing bro control because I have screen bottom boards. Like I'm always waiting for like, what else are you doing, right? It's, it's just one small little thing, but every little bit helps, I suppose. And to that, to that sentiment, you know, um, every little bit helps meaning that like, I have to be careful when I talk about this because some beekeepers will go crazy on this and remove all drones, but drone removal is also a way to kind of keep your mite populations 
lower to some degree, right? I, again, this comes down to varroa biology, but varroa would prefer to reproduce in drone um, in drone cells, and they will, uh, uh, you know, they can they reproduce more effectively and efficiently in those drone cells, and so. If you have colonies that are chock full of, of drones and you don't need that many drones, you can cut out some of the cells. Now, what I said, I don't want people to go too crazy because drones actually do serve a purpose, right? Like they are there to uh, to mate with virgin queens and, and things. So, you know, if, if you got uh, drone source colonies in your mating yards, obviously this is probably not what you're going to be doing. But this, just a simple thing that can kind of help reduce some mites and be a way that you can check for your uh, mites to some degree as well. I don't really like it as like a replacement for like an alcohol wash, um, but it, it can help to just pop some of those cells open and look for the mites. Um, it's, not a, it's not a standardized way of doing it, and that's why I feel like it's not as good as like an alcohol wash, but it does, it's, it's a way to, way to look. So, okay. So drone comb removal. So this can actually be a really efficient way to do this, um, but things have to be very special and work out just right for you to be able to do this well. But it has been shown to remove up to 95% of your mites at a time. So what you're doing is you're, you're creating, this is like a drone comb foundation, right? If you can get your queen to lay and she lays a nice solid drone pattern um, on, on that frame and you wait until those cells are capped, then you remove it, put it in your freezer, or you feed it to your chickens or something, right? And then you can return the frame later. But you're effectively killing all the, the um, varroa that would be in there. It's also kind of an expensive treatment, right? Like you are, uh, it takes a lot of energy for those bees to be able to rear that many drones. But kind of the idea is like one fell swoop, you're just removing tons of mites all at once. So it can be effective. Now, this last one I'll mention is just kind of still one of those things that it's a great idea in theory. I just haven't really seen it all come together yet in, in a convincing way in practice. But hyperthermia is the opposite of hypothermia, right? Hyperthermia means it's too hot. So you're basically heating up the hive and then you have to hold it steady at that temperature to kill the the mites. Now here's here's kind of the tricky part is the level that will kill varroa is usually about 40 do, 42 degrees Celsius. At about 44 degrees, you're going to start killing all your brood. So this is why it's like a little tricky um, and I wouldn't go cheap on this. I'm just using this one as an example. I'm not endorsing this company at all that that makes these style of hives, but but there are different um, ways that people are, are experimenting and using this in the United States. And some people have reported some, some pretty decent success. I know it works in a lab. It's one of those things that it's a little bit trickier to do um, inside of, of a hive. And if I was going to kind of go down this route and try this, I probably wouldn't go too cheap because you don't want to hurt your bees by having something that gets way too hot or just doesn't hold it steady and then it didn't really do anything anyways. Okay. Let's go on to biological controls. Now, biological controls means that you are using one organism to basically control another organism. I know a lot of you are already familiar with this because this is all over um, and just kind of nature. This is like nature finding a way to control and keep each other in balance and in check. We can do this okay for small hive beetles. This is like a small hive beetle larva that's been exposed to nematodes. And you can see how, you know, you can see the nematodes like exiting that larva and they've killed it in the soil. It works in other systems like, you know, caterpillars with parasitoid, uh, parasitic wasps, right? It just, thus far, it hasn't particularly worked well, in my opinion, with Varroa. You know, some researchers in New Zealand have spent a lot of time kind of looking at these pseudoscorpions that these killifers will eat Varroa. Um, there's no doubt about it. Like you put them in a, together in a Petri dish, yeah, they're going to chase those mites around and they'll catch them and eat them. But as like within the hive, it just just does not seem to really uh, be that effective. Same with like there's other predatory mites that are used in greenhouses a lot to control aphids or other uh, other mite pests on other plants. Um, 
but you put them into the hive and they just kind of all fall out the bottom or they just starve to death because they can't catch the mites because the mites are riding on the bodies of the bees and it just doesn't really work. Now, something interesting that may be coming down the pike a little bit more readily is like this use of entomorph pathogenic fungi, which are basically fungi that are, are penetrating the cuticle of the mite and then kind of growing and killing the mite. Now, this is another one of those things that can work fairly well in a petri dish, but it hasn't thus far panned out really into the at the colony level. And the reason for that is primarily because um, fungi don't really like warm temperatures, like or at least hot temperatures, right? Like the bees keep it inside the colony, like, you know, 32 to 34 degrees, they're keeping it warm in there already. So some researchers in the US are, are working to kind of select for fungi that can handle those higher temperatures to see if they can get it to, to control Varroa as a biological control. But thus far, we don't really have any uh, real options at that level. All right, let's move on to our chemical controls. We'll start with the natural chemicals, but before I even get into that, I, have to, I always get up on my soapbox just a little bit because there are a few things that drive me nuts as we talk about chemical controls. Now, I do a lot of research on toxicology and chemicals. So I'm just gonna be very honest with you. I am not anti-chemical. In fact, I like chemical controls. I think they work great. However, there are some things that you gotta keep in mind with, with chemical controls, especially if you're gonna avoid the mistakes that we have made in the United States, right? First of all, natural chemicals do not necessarily mean that they are just inherently safe. Not for you as a beekeeper, not for you as your bees. You do need to be careful about what you're putting into your hive. Um, and, and you need to be protecting your own self, your skin, to keep yourself uh, uh, safe. The next thing is going to be to follow the label. Now, that might be annoying for some of you, right? You might be like, looking at this like, wow, what are they like? If this says to put in two strips per brood chamber, I'm going to put in four because twice is better, right? Not necessarily, right? Remember that just about, we're trying to kill an arthropod that's on another arthropod, right? Like they're pretty similar physiologically in a lot of ways. And so one chemical that kills your mite is probably toxic to your honeybees as well. I kind of liken it to chemotherapy. It's like you're trying chemotherapy, you're trying to put in some a toxic chemical into your body to kill the cells that are cancerous, but not kill the whole body, right? You're kind of doing the same thing when you're using chemicals to treat for Varroa. So you do, the, the label represents research. It might not be perfect. It can change. And I advocate for label change here in the United States on, you know, oxalic acid and, and other treatments that I feel like need to be updated. But the label does represent research and we should follow that label. The last thing, this is probably the most critical part of integrated pest management chemical controls is that you just you need to rotate your treatments if we get hung up on what is cheap and what is quick and what is easy and we only use that tool over and over and over and over we're going to lose it i promise you you're going to lose it and because this is just exactly like the path that we have been on in this kind of endless varroa chemical treadmill that we find ourselves in is because we can't seem to convince everybody to just rotate your treatments, right? Okay, now I've kind of looked at some different lists um, of like what is available in Australia currently. Um, you know, as far as I can tell, it really comes down to kind of two products. You got Apigard and you got Formic Pro. So one is thymol based, one is Formic based. Um, I'd like, uh, very honestly, I'd like to see oxalic acid into that repertoire of like available uh, treatments because I think that works really well for us, but it's going to have to go through some kind of regulatory processes still to be able to be used um, for you all in Australia. But both of these products can work. They can actually work fairly well, but the timing is critical. You know, when it is too warm, it's not going to, it's not going to work you know, effectively. If it's too hot, you're going to drive your bees out because that means it's going to be releasing too much chemical at once because both of these products are very volatile. If it's too cold, that means it's not releasing enough and it's not going to do enough for your bees and you won't really see an effect. So that's kind of all. I'm just going to leave it here at formic acid and thymol. I have seen good effects uh, at you when I've used these appropriately. And I have 
also seeing effects where I've hurt my bees pretty bad when I have used them improperly, right? So you need to be smart. It works the best for us in our early spring. We can hit it and it, it really helps clear up a lot of our things. But this is like one more reminder. Be careful. Take care of yourself. Cover your skin. Cover your eyes. Um, this respirators don't really apply unless you're using oxalic acid vapor necessarily, but still just be careful. I mean, uh, make the mistake once of breathing deep when you open up a box of Formic Pro. Like it's going to hit you so hard that you will have learned your lesson. So be careful. All right, let's move on to the last little step here is our synthetic chemical control. I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going to get on my horse and go a little faster here, but we can go fast with this because I'm just giving you the really quick history. I am, and from what I understand, like Apistan is registered. Um, this was the first product that was registered for and legal for us to use in the United States. It's a pyrethroid. It's um, essentially, it's different active ingredient, but similar to like Baverol. Baverol is also a pyrethroid. And these, this was like the first thing that was used in the United States, but because everybody used it for about five or six years, we ran out or like it just stopped working and, and like completely stopped working and we lost that, that as an option. So then everybody scrambled for the next thing, which was Checkmite, which I don't think is actually registered and I wouldn't recommend it anyways, because it's pretty hard on your bees. But um, everybody was using this for about two to three years is all it took. And then we lost it very quickly as the mites became resistant to it. We have gotten away with Amitraz use in honeybee colonies for a long time in the United States. And it, you know, our chickens are coming home to roost. We're, we're getting our comeuppance, right? Like we're losing Amitraz rapidly. Um, Apivar for us does not really provide very good control anymore in our, even in our like uh, university colonies. It's just, there's so much amitraz use around us that it it's not we're, we're just seeing that it just doesn't work particularly well now that doesn't mean that would be the same for you especially if you've got these mites that have not been exposed to chemical controls for a long time um then then it could uh be an effective treatment for you still but for us it's on the fence it's kind of on its way out so we're kind of a lot of beekeepers are in this panic mode of like, okay, what do we do? We need to find some more treatments. And this is why more US beekeepers are finally kind of getting on board this IPM train because we're learning that we have to do different things than what we've done historically. Um, I'm part of a group in the US that is still looking for new active ingredients as chemical controls, but we're doing our best, um, but it's a slow process, right? So the last kind of take home message I'm gonna leave for you is that Integrated pest management is actually good for your bees, but it's also good for your wallet. Um, it will, if instead of just applying treatments on a calendar basis, like we do in a lot of our other areas of agriculture, um, treating when you need treatment by mon like spending the money and the time to just monitor and have an idea of where your mite loads are at is going to be so key and it'll help prevent you from wasting your money on continually applying a treatment that's not working. Um, that's, I think, the biggest argument I can make to U.S. beekeepers is like, you don't know if the the chemical controls that you are using are working unless you actually go back in and check, right? So monitoring is so important. It will save you money in the long run for sure. Um, it'll also preserve those treatment efficacy so you can continually to rotate between all these different kinds of treatments and so you're not just getting hung up on the same thing over and over.